Welcome back to Rethinking Politics, episode 28. Today we're discussing free speech, though free speech is not how I would frame it. That's not what I would call it. That's not the thing that I feel like we're discussing. That's probably what other people would call what we're discussing. Are you confused yet? Don't worry. We're going to unravel those threads. Hopefully, hopefully, or fail miserably trying. This week in the news, which will be last week by the time you hear this, there's been some fun developments. Robin Hood. No little John, just Robin Hood. <laughs> GameStop and a few of those other stocks that have been uh, rallied by a few different, you know, online chat groups that have tried to push back against the hedge funds and pull pull off a short squeeze to punish sure. those hedge funds for uh for shorting those stocks and it's actually been very interesting. And then of course there's the pushback against Robinhood for slowing and then blocking trading on those specific stocks for at least a temporary amount of time. Right. Discord kicks the channel, Reddit blocks the thread. None of those things were specifically what we wanted to talk about. What we wanted to talk about is the free speech and how it pertained to what happened a few weeks ago with the storming of the Capitol, with Twitter and Facebook and Trump, with Parler and a lot of those things. But a lot of those things are are very much the same. You know, Reddit and Discord closing down those groups, stopping people from communicating is very similar to what Twitter and Facebook did to Trump. And I think right now we're reaching the apex of a time where people are very interested and how much control and influence big tech has over our lives. Because big yeah. tech has had a lot of control over our lives for a long time. It's been a known it's been a known fact that when you create a Google account and use Google, you sign their disclaimer, their their contract as it were, and you don't read it because almost no one reads it. But it's very long and it gives them carte blanche in many, many different ways. And and we just don't worry about it. We don't worry about the control that it actually gives them, that we freely agree to. Now those contracts and those agreements are are coming back to bite people in the butt because almost all of these contracts, in fact, some of them are just disclaimers because they are so one-sided. Because this is not an exchange, it's rather we allow you to use our services and we can do whatever we want. Right. Those are the kind of terms you're going to get if you're doing a free service. That's, <laughs> I mean, to, if there's no money trading hands, that's that's pretty much the norm. Yeah, if you don't give them money, you have almost no leverage, which is something we're going to talk about in this episode because it, it pertains greatly to free speech because most speech that occurs today doesn't occur in a public square. You know, if you go back and you look at Supreme Court cases, they talk yeah. about the, the public square where people are talking and whether or not they're allowed to to say certain things, there aren't really public squares anymore. I mean, there are still a few public squares, and you occasionally have people right. saying things there. But but really, where communication occurs, where speech occurs, is through technology. And that almost always means private companies. Right. They're often labeled public square. <laughs> the new public square is online, which is just a really weird way to think of it. Public square is a place, but here we are in the digital age. It's a it's an interesting question. And you mentioned that this is a this has kind of been an ongoing theme. This has been something that a lot of people have been afraid of for years. This is something that is making news on a regular basis now, the kind of power they have and where the lines are. And if the lines are not written in the contract, you know, if, they're, if they claim all authority to do all things, then well, what rights do people have? You know, what can we say and what can we not say? And I want to first present the conversation as I've heard it up to this point. You may have noticed when we discuss an idea, we rarely discuss it in the terms that you hear in normal news. If, if all we had to say was what everybody else was saying, we wouldn't bother <laughs> at the very least, at the very least, we have the the audacity to presume that we can say it better. But in most cases, we're actually saying it in a fundamentally different way. We're approaching it from a different angle. We're looking at it from a different perspective that might allow you to see it clearer than 
listening to your average pundit. Here's how I hear the pundits over the last few months presented. Now you get people, people who are talking about this first off who are almost always conservative. They're the ones who feel threatened by this. And for other reasons that we'll probably get into later, liberals don't feel as threatened. They, they have a tendency to offer at least tacit support for these kind of things. The, uh, the other reason that it's more conservatives and less liberals right now is because the conservatives are the ones who are being censored. The conservatives are the ones who are on the losing side of this debate. In many ways, a lot of the left actually agrees with the conservatives about some of these issues, but because they're on the winning side, they're not going to worry about that right now. You know, when you've right. got the upper hand in American politics, you keep your mouth shut and you just go with it. Because if you actually, you know, push came to shove, ask them about what's happening with these companies and how it's being handled, they're probably not crazy about it. Yeah. And for sure, if it were swapped, they'd have a hard time with it. But because it's really helping them right now, they're just they're just going to let it let it slide for a little bit. Right. And some of them are the most enthusiastic supporters are people who are genuinely afraid that that if these are not silenced right, there will be serious consequences. There'll be real violence and harm done. We mentioned this, the political pressure, the, the, the way the parties align, because so often people look at the way the parties are and they read it back into history. They go, Republicans right now are arguing for free speech and Democrats are against free speech. That's first off an oversimplification. But beyond that, it's not historically true. It's not yeah. the way it's the parties are aligned now is rarely how they've always been aligned. In fact, maybe never, maybe never. There might be a few issues where a party is actually the same now as it was when it was formed. I doubt it. Parties shift. People's opinions shift. Parties move. They're fluid. They're not nearly as stable as people think they are. And on free speech here, in fact, most of the claims against free speech in the past, some of the most famous Supreme Court cases on the topic, were Republican war hawks, if you could call them that before the age of war hawks. Um, I'm just talking about the anachronistic reading of current affairs onto previous events, and there I go doing it. <laughs> but Republicans who were more in favor of security than Democrats at the time would often prosecute people for talking things like like about talking positively about communism and stuff like that. So you get a lot of Supreme Court cases handling those kind of issues in the past, things where they thought this was a security threat and whether or not speech that tends towards violence or tends towards uh, that hurts security in some way should be allowed. And where those lines should be drawn. But the conversation right now is among conservatives is something like this. Now, tech companies are private companies. And we like private companies being able to do whatever a private company wants to do. It's their property. It's their stuff. They decide. But look at the power they have. Look at the power. They can silence people. This is where the term public square comes in, right? This is the public square, they claim. This is where your voice is heard. This is where your social influence is exercised. And therefore, this is where your right to speech ought to be protected. It has to be in the public square. It has to be in the place where you can influence and talk to people. And if that's online through a private company, so be it. Now, Republicans will go back and forth on that issue. Some of them, I mean, they have a tendency not to like the government telling people what to say or what they can't say and, and getting involved in these businesses. But I'm surprised how many of them are very eager for this kind of this kind of stepping in and telling businesses what they can and can't do. And how the argument works is that because Twitter and Facebook and Reddit and, and Discord and all of these other companies are now public squares, as it were, that means if you block someone off of those websites or if you restrict what someone can say on those websites, you're actually blocking free speech. That's the argument that conservatives are making, that the government should step in to protect free speech in these new public forums online. Even though they are private companies, they aren't really private. And you may or may not be aware, but you know who else likes this idea? The companies like this idea. <laughs> Which is surprising. You'd think that the companies wouldn't, but there's a very simple reason why they do. Because right now, the companies are getting so much crap from both sides. Because no matter what they do, they're pissing off a large number of people. And if the government steps in and regulates them and say, this is who is allowed to speak and this is who isn't allowed in these forums and this is what they're allowed to say, 
then the companies can wash their hands of it and say, listen, these are the rules. We didn't make the rules. We just have to enforce them. I can tell you as a middle manager, that is a very effective tool <laughs> for for getting people to follow unpleasant rules. Say, I can't change these rules, but I'm going to enforce them. If you want to change the rules, you're going to talk to someone higher up than me. And you're welcome to. I won't stop you. I, in fact, I encourage you. Go talk to them. Go talk to Congress, man. And and they may even they may even act annoyed about some of those rules. They may even be annoyed about some of those rules. But all in all, at least for the really big companies, the really big companies like Facebook and Twitter that have gotten so much political flack for what's been said on on their sites, it's just going to make life so much easier for these companies. And these companies are there to make money. And if they lose huge chunks of business because of mood swings of the people, that's not a great business model. And so if they can get Congress to take all the negative flack and just worry about their business, they're going to benefit. <laughs> Don't you love this passing of responsibility? Because because you're saying that, I was thinking, you know what Congress will probably do? They'll probably make a commission of some kind. <laughs> pass it on again and pass it to the executive branch right exactly exactly nobody actually wants to be responsible for something that makes a lot of people unhappy and our our system has become expert at passing that on whether it be by getting the government to come and regulate you or in some form or another or whether it be a uh, congress itself passing responsibility around but yes it's you're, it's precisely right and it makes sense i mean as you said they probably have policy preferences. What They probably have an opinion about which way the government should go. Should it favor free speech as the Republicans are saying it? Or should it favor preventing uh, speech that they, the kind of speech that they've taken to preventing themselves? Right now, one of the difficult things for these businesses is that they are often held responsible for the things that happen on them. Like the US government doesn't run Facebook. They can't kick people off of Facebook directly, we think. But what they can do is they can say, hey, Facebook, this is the standard for free speech. And if you fail to make sure that's what happens on your site, you're in big trouble. And Facebook goes, uh, okay. And so what do they do? They're going to err on the safe side. Mm -hmm. They're going to err on anything that could be even close because they don't actually judge, right? They don't, they don't decide whether it's violence. They don't decide whether something that is said is okay or not if it goes to court. Now we've mentioned two of these groups who are involved in this situation. You know, you've got the conservative side who believes that these are really public squares where free speech needs to be protected. If the private companies won't, then the government needs to step in. I'm sure the conservatives would say that ideally we would just have unlimited free speech in these private companies. But because the private companies aren't allowing that, we have to do something. And then you've got the private companies who are saying, yes, do something. Take, take the negative flack away. And we'll be just fine with that. Like I said, especially the big companies. And then you've mm -hmm. got the, the left. You've got the liberals who say they agree with the conservatives. There needs to be regulation because we cannot have complete free speech in these public forums. And we'll they, get another storming of the Capitol or worse. Exactly. They're, these ideas are – some. exactly. Some of these ideas are too dangerous and people are inciting violence and this needs to – needs to be stopped and needs to be controlled. And these conversations can take place on these sites, but they need to be regulated to make sure that it's safe. And so they agree with the conservatives that regulation needs to occur. They may just disagree about how much regulation and of what kind. And of course, that brings us to the root cause of all this, which is why Facebook and Twitter block Trump in the first place. And Facebook and Twitter block Trump for inciting violence or <laughs> which which of course you know Dan's laughing but of course it makes sense there there was a riot and people died and that's not funny that's not why Dan's laughing the reason Dan's laughing is because of what Trump actually said and how they construed what he said into what happened for those of you who aren't familiar with what happened we're just going to take Twitter as as an example and, and le let that one stand. So what happens is, is Trump says some things. Trump encourages people to protest. You know, that's that's pretty straightforward. Encourages them to go to the Capitol and protest. And then his supporters go to the Capitol. They protest. And a number of those supporters 
break into the capital, storm the capital, do a lot of property damage, and people end up getting hurt and people end up dying, right? That's what happened. As that happened, during that, that process, Twitter puts a ban on Trump. That's not a permanent ban. It's a ban and it's also a warning. The ban was for 24 hours and Trump was warned that if he did something like this again, if he incited violence again, Trump was warned that if he incited violence again, he'd be permanently banned from Twitter. Well, lo and behold, after his 24 hours are up, the next day, Trump sends out two tweets. And immediately after those two tweets, maybe not immediately, but soon thereafter, Twitter comes out and permanently bans Trump from the site and lists their reasons and says it's because he incited violence, he didn't heed the warning, and therefore he must be banned. And it's beautiful. You can look it up. They actually made a statement. It's, most of the time they don't make a public statement. Yeah, there's a public statement on, on Twitter's blog that lists their reasons for why they did it and breaks down the tweets that Donald Trump sent. And let me just read to you the two tweets one after the other, they're not too far apart. This is all on January 8th. First tweet, quote, the 75 million great American patriots, patriots who voted for me, America first and make America great again, will have a giant voice long into the future. They will not be disrespected or treated unfairly in any way, shape. Second tweet, to all of those who have asked, I will not be going to the inauguration on January 20th. And for those tweets, Twitter reported that he violated their glorification of violence policy. And they break down all the different ways that he did it. And their argument was very simple. Their argument was that in nowhere did Trump explicitly call for violence, but their fear was that people might interpret Trump's words as encouraging people to be violent. For example, let me read one of their sections in their determination. The second tweet may also serve as encouragement to those potentially considering violent acts that the inauguration would be a safe target, as he will not be attending. In other words, when Trump said he would not be attending the inauguration, he was letting his supporters know, hey, bomb the heck out of that thing. I won't be there, so it's no big deal. <laughs> and it's so amazing because, because that level of construing means that that almost anyone could be shut down. The only reason they're not is because they don't have the kind of following that Trump has. You know, right. and it and it leaves it so much up to the discretion of Twitter. Right. They're in in it's interesting in the wording they were saying, as you were saying, the the problem specifically is not that they think he's saying that that's what should happen. The problem is that they're convinced that people will understand it that way. We'll interpret it that way, whether right, or not that was right. his intent. Right, whether or not that were his intent. Maybe they also think that was his intent, but that's not the case they're making. The case they're making is people will read that and they'll go, look, he's signaling us. He's telling us he's not going to be there so that we can act freely and not have to worry about accidentally getting him. Yes, people are going to interpret Trump's words that way. It's just yeah, inevitable. There's got to be somebody, yeah. There, there, there <laughs> probably is someone who's going to interpret yeah. his words that way. Which, of course, begs the question, where does the line fall when it comes to speech? How does speech operate? Where does the line of causality stop? Where does does it become your responsibility and when is it not your responsibility? Yeah, yeah. You can go back to all sorts of things. You look at – let's look at the last year. Let's look at the Black Lives Matter movement, specifically the organization. That organization has said many times – that what is happening in regards to the black community is wrong and it's unjust and something needs to happen. And they said that repeatedly. After they said that, people protested. And in those protests, there were riots and people got hurt and people died. Should Black Lives Matter be held responsible for encouraging people to protest, even though those protests resulted occasionally in these riots? The answer's got to be no. It has to be no. You can't, like you said, there is too much room between me saying something with a certain intention and somebody later, <laughs> this isn't even somebody interpreting it and doing something bad. This is somebody later doing that thing that I advised 
and then losing control of their temper <laughs> and flipping out and doing something drastic. Yeah, I mean, what Trump did and what the Black Lives Matter organization did is the same in terms of their connection to the violence. Trump told people to protest. Trump told people there was something horribly, horribly wrong, which pissed people off, yeah. which fired them up, which made them real angry. Like that, that's, we're not trying to, to deny that fact. He did that. He made people feel like the system was broken. Yeah. Does any of this sound familiar? Because that's exactly what the Black Lives Matter organization was trying to right. do, was to get people pissed off, get people to realize that this system is broken. This is fundamentally wrong, and something needs to happen. That's what both of these people did. You got the Black Lives Matter movement and Trump making people angry and encouraging them to do something. And in both cases, people did something. And in both cases, people got hurt. Yeah, it, it's so similar. And like, like you're saying, that people don't realize that the Black Lives Matter movement, at the heart of it was an idea that uh, the movement, of course, had broader reaches than just the people who run the organization. But the organization itself was interested in things like ending the system entirely. You know, things like when they say when they say get rid of the police, they're not saying right now the police are doing bad things. And what we need to do is reform the police so they don't do bad things. They're saying no. there's something inherently wrong with policing. And policing as a general category has to cease you know, or, or injustice will continue to happen because it's because at some point in time, uh, the police were doing things against blacks and slavery and on and on. It's, it's that weird historical digression that often critical race theorists engage in. But that's besides the point. As Brad was saying, the similarities between, between these cases is really high. If you're going to start holding people accountable, not just for what they say and what they mean, but for, for what people who happen to believe it do in addition – you have a serious problem. You're not just beyond the limits of what would of what should be. You're well beyond those limits. Like if you were to draw a line, you're already past the line. If that's the question you're asking, <laughs> you're well beyond the line at that point. Here's an example from a TV show that I enjoy watching called Community. It's in one of the later seasons, and the show is about a community college. This community college is garbage. It's a terrible community college. In one particular year. A community college class was terminated, not because of any student's bad behavior, but because of silly reasons. And the students were all told they'd have to retake that class that summer. This, of course, pissed a lot of the students off. And so during, a, during a, an assembly of those students, several students got up and talked about how upset they were with this community college. One after the other after the other, they were just listing things that the community college had done in the past year to hurt the students. And at the very end of all of these students speaking, one student gets up and says, let's burn this mother down and starts a riot. <laughs> and the students go crazy. They, they, trash, they trash everything, right? And cause lots of damage. <laughs> And those students who spoke, all of them, not just the last student, are brought before the board, and they're all suspended from the community college, and they're all – actually, they're expelled, excuse me, from the community college for their actions. And as I watched this, I thought, well, it sure makes sense for the last student who literally requested violence to get expelled from the school because inciting violence is a very real thing. But the earlier students didn't actually call for violence. All they did was voice their legitimate grievances against the school, which caused the students to be angry. So are they responsible for that anger? Because they would argue that they're not responsible for the anger. The school is. They're simply responsible for speaking the truth. And... And yet they're expelled. And it's, it's similar to what we're seeing here is, is if you hold people responsible for speaking true statements that are not a lie that cause people to get upset and do things, are they responsible for those people's actions when they are not asking for those people to commit violence? And as Dan said, as soon as you start making that connection – then political speech as we know it is going to have to stop because yeah, we've recorded cease. this episode 
I mean, we've recorded many episodes where we've talked about things that are wrong with the current system. And someone listening to this podcast might say, yes, you're right. The criminal justice system is broken. And so I'm going to load up this shotgun and I'm going to shoot as many judges as possible, which obviously we really do not want anyone to do. And it would be horrible if someone did it. But if that person did, you know, we'd have to be arrested and probably there'd be half a dozen other other radio shows and podcasts that that person listened to that said anything bad about the government and they would all be arrested too because they were responsible for that person's actions and so on and so forth. You know, the Black Lives Matter organization would have to shut down because they would be held responsible for any riot that occurred at any Black Lives Matter protest. And that's just not sustainable. It's not sustainable. And it's, and it's not that far out of the norm. So obviously we're a long, we're hopefully we're a long ways from any legal action being taken against us for something that some random person who listened to us decides to do when it has nothing to do with directly what we said, right? It's, if, if what we were doing was calling for people to go do that, maybe that changes things. And it would, change things. Not. it would change things. It would change things. the discussion. It would absolutely. Change it would. It would. It would change the conversation completely. If what you're saying is, if we ended every episode with, and therefore you should go do something terrible. But this is, if you haven't noticed, this has actually been a tendency in society for quite some time. And it's a, it's a tendency to say, in part, and it's a tendency in part because it's easier to associate people with bad things than it is to actually argue with them. And so often what happens in society is you'll get, you'll get somebody who makes a claim and someone who doesn't like that claim. And they'll say, the reason you're making that claim is because you're a racist. Or the reason you're making that claim is because of some other reason, right? Racism is the first one that comes to mind. It's probably the most common. And so this kind of labeling is an attempt to do exactly that socially if not by the law. It's an attempt to say, you associate with certain ideas. I associate those ideas with racism. Therefore, you are racist. I have interpreted your words in such a way that I can align you in this manner and judge you. And this is a, besides being a shortcut to thinking that is illogical, a shortcut to analysis and getting to know people and actually dealing with ideas on their own merits, it's extremely dangerous. It's extremely dangerous. And how do you draw a line? Like, where's the, if, if let's say for a second, you did like this idea, you like the, the idea that someone could be hold, held responsible for making someone extreme. Someone listens to our podcast and they become extreme in some way. And they, uh, we, what's the word? We radicalize them. That's the word I'm yeah. looking for. I, I love that term. You're radicalizing people. <laughs> I don't, I don't know what the word radical means anymore. The way I see it used, it's, uh, it's apparently not what I thought. I thought it was cool. Um, <laughs> I thought it was rad. <laughs> I'm watching too many Ninja Turtles, my kids. We've radicalized someone. How many people do we have to radicalize before you say we're actually, it's actually our fault and not their fault? You know, maybe they're just interpreting us wrong. Or maybe they were already radical. I mean, how do you, how do you draw the line? Let's say we, let's say a, a thousand people listen to a speech we give. If one of them becomes radical, is that enough? What if we talk to a million people and one of them becomes, it's like, okay, I'm going to burn it down. What if we talking to the whole world, right? And, and one of them responds. You see how this hands power from the reasonable people to the crazy people? This is, <laughs> this is saying we're going to judge everything through the eyes of the person who can't function normally and can't understand words, right? <laughs> we're going to give, we're going to let society be determined by that guy. We're going to give him the authority to decide whether something is crazy or not. And you'll quickly see how debilitating it is. And that's why I said it would change political speech forever right. because – You'd have to be so careful. You'd have to be so careful. You would never be able to say anything concrete because anything concrete – could be misinterpreted by one crazy person and you'd be held responsible for it because almost all political speech is either for or against concrete things by definition. You know, if you say, if you're a Republican and you say the liberals are wrong, not even bad, but just wrong in this mm -hmm. particular case, 
then someone could easily interpret that to mean we have to stop them by force. And there goes your shotgun toting crazy again. So you can't even say that the other side is wrong or that you disagree with them on a particular issue without being held responsible. And of course, people are going to argue, well, that's that's taking it to an extreme. And I'm like, oh, dang it. Now we've already radicalized someone. But no, but <laughs> <laughs> we blew it. <laughs> it's, it's too late. We're done. No, but but seriously, someone's going to say that you're taking it to an extreme, that you're overgeneralizing, you're oversimplifying, that the line is somewhere closer. You know, it's not there. It's not one person. It's it's more people. It's it's Trump is different because so many of the people he's talking to are crazy redneck Republicans who are neo-Nazis and et cetera, and He's got to know how they're going to interpret his words. And he knows that that's what they want to hear and that he really is signaling them. And first of all, if that's true, if Trump knows that his words are inciting violence, that's a very different discussion. That was not held by Twitter at any point <laughs> when they banned him. There and and so you if you want to go ahead and conduct an investigation, that's a, a reasonable look into whether or not Trump knew that that was going to happen. That's a very different discussion. That's not what we're talking about today. What we're talking about is the fact that people are looking at Trump's words, seeing the results afterwards from people who heard those words. And saying, we cannot allow Trump to say those words, regardless of his intent. We're living in a world that more and more is about end results. That more and more are about, it doesn't matter your intent. It doesn't matter what you even did. All that matters is the final result. You know, it's like we talked about before with racism, where it's all about outcomes and not about actions. And when it comes to free speech, you'll quickly realize that even if you draw the line in one place today, that line's going to shift tomorrow. And before you know it, speech as we know it is going to be regulated out of existence. Yeah, it's true. It's true. And it's a slippery slope because there, once you, there are very few places you can draw a line. And if you don't draw a line, uh, you give power over to arbitrary judgment. I mean, if, there, if there isn't a clear point where you can say, here is incitement to violence. Here, not incitement to violence. And and see where that line is. Maybe maybe that line is thick, meaning it covers, you know, it's a little gray in a very, very few cases. That's You can work with that. But having no line at all means people in power get to decide. And who's in power? Well, in any given 10-year period, someone you hate is in power. I mean, that's just the nature of it. It's just the way yeah. it works. Any given, you, you look at a long term at all even 10 years, you're going to find someone who you strongly disagree with who's going to be wielding that power. Giving that power is not the answer. Um, I agree you were talking about how this is we're giving extreme example. We are, we are, because in part because this is the direction it's heading. This isn't fiction, right? This isn't, Yeah. I, I've read 1984 several times and it's, it's, it's more and more weird how close we're getting. <laughs> it's uncomfortably close. You don't want to be even looking in that direction. But also because this is a starting point for this discussion. You you look at that and you say, okay, that's too far. That's too far. You can't say that I am responsible for however anyone in the world might decide to interpret my words. That's a, that's a responsibility I could never bear. But if all you're looking at is consequences, if all you're looking at is not intentions, if you're going to say no intentions don't matter, what matters is the results. What is good for society? My intentions are irrelevant. And so many people are looking at society that way. I heard somebody say, as we're considering this topic and bouncing ideas around, we were one of the common phrases I heard was something like, well, there are certain things that people could say provide no societal benefit. So they shouldn't be allowed to say that. Yeah, if, if they provide no societal benefit or they have the potential to provide a net detriment to society – if they have a detrimental impact on society, then they shouldn't be allowed to speak because they're making things worse or not making things better. And I just want to stop you even as you're saying that because it's painful, that kind of language. It's not how life works. That's not, that's not the terms that human beings think in. Detriment and benefit to society. The, the problem is that anytime you talk that way, what you're actually going through is your own head. And in your own head, there's good and there's bad. 
There's things that you want. There's things that you don't want. And everyone has different things that they value. And so when you say this society, this creature, this society, it's good for society, by whose judgment right, is, the, is the right question to that? It's good for society according to who? And with this, once again, we're not just talking about fiction. We've, we've already talked about COVID a couple of times, and there's, there are different narratives about what's happening with COVID. As you may have noticed, our narrative doesn't align with the, the most common narrative that's being told. If you go to YouTube and you look up YouTube's user policy and, and, and what they've done, they are very clear. If they believe that what you're saying is not true, they can kick you off. They can kick you off for a number of reasons, and I'm not trying to single out YouTube. I'm trying to point to the fact that this is becoming more and more popular because the only reason YouTube's doing this is because people want them to, to try and censor those people who have the wrong information, which means that we're not just saying, hey, we're not going to allow you to speak because people listening might commit violence. They're saying, we're not going to allow you to speak because the information you're conveying is inaccurate and someone might hear that information and make bad choices with their lives. You know, they may decide to go to a party with 12 people who aren't wearing masks because you told them COVID isn't a big deal. And first of all, I want to acknowledge that they're absolutely right, that when you say something that's inaccurate and people listen to it, it can have detrimental effects on their lives. That's true. That's accurate. But the problem here, and something that, that I think often gets overlooked, is the fact that now we have to have someone who decides what's true and what's not. And that means that we need to have some kind of governing body that is the body of deciding truth. And maybe we could call it a ministry. Like it could be a ministry of truth. And they would decide <laughs> what people were allowed to say and what they couldn't say for the public good. I'm just riffing off of Dan's 1984, 1984 reference. reference those because, because for those of you who have read 1984, you can see how even though we're not there now, the similarities, especially in, in where the trend is going, is scary. It is. Because even though the government is not regulating speech in significant ways in what we're talking about now, people want them to. That idea has gained a large amount of popularity. You know, with COVID, people are like, yeah, this is disgusting that people are encouraging people to be anti-COVID restrictions, and that's costing people their lives, and we need to put a stop to it. And a lot of people are like, yeah, we need to put a stop to it because they can see the clear negative outcome on society, right? Or at least yeah. what they believe is a clear negative outcome on society. I was just thinking one of the one of the details I think is important for this is like to believe that that a ministry of truth is going to be the effective answer, right? That you, what you what you actually need is you just need a body of of people who are fact checking these things and can inform the rest of us of what the truth is about these issues. There's an assumption there, and the assumption is that <laughs> there's at least one assumption there, and the assumption that that it strikes me that you have to believe that the truth is obvious and that your opponents are idiots. <laughs> and they can't see it, right? right? There's a there's yeah. an arrogance to this, and and it's one of the the nastiest parts of our of the partisanship. I know Republicans is that both sides think the other sides are complete <laughs> idiots. They do. I know Republicans who think the other side is made up of a bunch of brainwashed idiots, like truly stupid people. And the opposite is also true. There are a lot of Democrats who are convinced that Republicans are just a bunch of hillbillies. And that the problem is they don't know how to think. And so if you just had someone who would look up the answer for them and tell it to them, some kind of ministry, <laughs> it's not ministry in the religious sense here. This is ministers like the history of Britain uses them um, <laughs> as uh, heads of, uh, of different divisions and things, departments. Um, I but, thought you meant they wore wigs, but continue. Anyway. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe they're minstrels. Maybe that's what we need, a minstrel of truth. And they could sing it. You've got to think that your fact checker, your person, could look, find the right answer, and could make a compelling case for it easily. And that 
it's just a lack of information that's the problem, right? That if these people would just look it up, they'd get it. They'd go, lack of information and the prevalence of bad information. Yes, yes. That people wouldn't be anti-COVID vaccine if it weren't for all these people who were spreading disinformation about the COVID vaccine. Yeah, and this is – it's that arrogance that really, really ticks me off. It it upsets me. I I hate – the way that people talk about this stuff is if they just needed someone to come in and let me know what's good for me and I'd be okay in life. Life is ridiculously hard and it's ridiculously complicated. Part of what we, why we do this is we want you to embrace a world of nuance, a world where it's not straightforward, where the, where the simple stories may be helpful, but are never the full picture. And to do that, you have to struggle. You have to look, you have to search and as soon as people start telling you what you're supposed to think, that can't happen. Your individual journey is over. And it, maybe, it, maybe it's good for society, whoever that is. This, this <laughs> mythical creature that's apparently out there. I've, I've yet to meet society. What I've met is a lot of people, some of whom are happy and, some of, and many of whom are not. And everyone's struggling. And that group, that group doesn't need you to come and command them by legal fiat how to run their lives. It will do them no good, and it will do them much harm. At best, you stop them from thinking for themselves, and they just go along with it because they're scared of the punishment. And, and a lot of people are saying, okay, well, that sounds like a fantastic idea. <laughs> here's, here's the problem with a ministry of truth in a nutshell. Let's say that we come up with a very solid organization whose whole goal is to make sure that the information out there is true, and they can stop anyone who's saying something they believe is not true and shut them down, right? In other words, the end result of that is that they control the flow of information. This mini ministry of truth decides what is said and what is not said. The short-term result is that there's going to be one clear message that everyone hears, right? Assuming people are generally on board with it, this is not, this is not 1984, but assuming people are generally on board with it, it means that people are going to start having the same ideas, right? Because they're all hearing the same thing. But then something else is going to happen. Now there's going to be an incredible amount of power all in this organization. This organization that initially was composed of people who love truth, right? That's where we found these people to be in this ministry mm -hmm. of truth. Mm -hmm. But now people are going to go there not because they love truth, they're going to apply to be in that ministry of truth because they love power, because of all the power that is going to be resting in that body, because that body is going to decide what people think, which is going to decide what people do. And pretty soon, that body is going to change from a bunch of truth-loving people to a bunch of power-loving people who are going to use that power however they decide, and soon the ministry of truth will have nothing to do with truth. And everything to do with getting people to do things to accomplish whatever result the people who love power want. Right. Because it never works the way we want to because people are people. That sounds that sounds obviously redundant. <laughs> but yeah, is that is that there are no people who are perfect. And even if you could find good people now, down the road, those good people are not yeah. going to be replaced with good people. They're going to be replaced with the worst of humanity, because it's going to be the worst of humanity who would have the audacity, the arrogance, and the cruelty to try and control people's lives that way. So what we are arguing is that when you hear your opponent say something so obviously false and stupid and untrue, you should be glad that you live in a world where people are allowed to think things that are just wrong, where people are allowed to decide for themselves what to believe in. Because it, it's... It's fantastic. I think it it's it really is. I think it's beautiful that that we can disagree fundamentally. And I think more and more people are accepting the idea that people cannot disagree. Fundamentally, people cannot disagree that Republicans and Democrats cannot have different ideas about what happens. And that's 
And it's because of the power, right? It all comes down to the idea of power. Because if I have an idea and Dan has an idea and those ideas are fundamentally different, but we each live our own lives, it doesn't matter. But as soon as it becomes a world where everyone needs to be the same, they need to act the same and do the same, then it becomes very important that me and Dan both only have my ideas. Because it's either my ideas or Dan's ideas, both can't coexist. Right, right. We and we've discussed this the 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 centralizing of things that are important in life into the federal government, and what a disastrous way that silences life and the thoughts of a lot of people and the choices that they would make. And there's a flip side to this that I that as you're talking about, I I really want to mention being able to think for yourself is irrelevant if you don't also get to suffer the consequences. There's a flip side to free speech in, the, in this this discussion. I still hate the term free speech. <laughs> I still hate it. <laughs> There's a flip side to this discussion about letting people say and think things that are different without silencing them. One of the most helpful things in life is the fact that you get to play out your ideas and see how stupid they are. Stupid ideas don't work. That's one of the good, that's good news, right? We live in a world where, <laughs> where if I want to be, build a square wheel, it will not turn. I want to live in a ridiculous manner that ticks a lot of people off. I will have few friends. <laughs> if I want to, if I don't want to do something helpful to society, I don't get any money. Now, there's a, there's a lot of natural consequences. That, that keep people exists. from doing things. Yeah, that keep people from doing these things. Now, we've done a lot in our society in the name of doing good to remove natural consequences. There's a discussion to be had there on another day. You can remove some consequences in a way that prevent people from learning and seeing. And that is a mistake. Now, you can also, but you also want to help people. So there's You've got two conflicting things there that don't have to conflict. You can reconcile them. There are ways you can help people that help them in the long run and not just in the short run. But it's all part of this idea that you are supposed to be going somewhere. That life isn't just about society. That life's also about your story and that your story matters. And not just as a plus or minus on the scale of what's good for society. You're a real credit to society, son. (laughs) (laughs) there's got to be more praise than that right there's got to be more to life than that and there is there's so much more but we get stuck when we talk politics because we feel like it's a common language to talk that way like oh this is good for society back to big tech back to the policies in front of us so applying this idea that this idealism that we've been talking about that really what we want is for people to be able to speak and that that is the key to good communication. I know it's 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 breathtakingly beautiful and simplistic. <laughs> silencing you isn't persuasive, Brad. What if I throw you in yes, jail? Yes, that doesn't that, change that your opinion. Silencing people is is really never the solution, and that's something that we've seen in our country. You know, the few times where there's been serious pushback has been devastating. Like, look at McCarthyism, where yeah. where they were opposing and shutting down. And arresting people for being communists and for joining the Communist Party, which, by the way, the Communist Party's goal was to overthrow the government. Like they were yeah, very straightforward about time, it. Violent overthrow their, of the government. Their their long term goal was violence, and so there even was a real legal argument to be made against not allowing these peop- people to associate and to speak. And yet, when we allowed those people to exist and to speak we were better off than when we tried to stop them. And stopping them was both ineffective and incredibly damaging. And so a lot of people right now are thinking we should err on the side of caution. And we agree completely, but we mean the other side of caution. (laughs) That we need to let people speak. And and if you're not sure, if there's any doubt at all, then they should be allowed to. Because as soon as you start Moving that line back, it's a very slippery slope. So how do we apply that in the real world? You know, we started by talking about big tech, about these companies who have become the public square for discussion, the public forum, as it were, while still being private companies. And a lot of conservatives who agree with us about the importance of free speech believe that the solution 
is to regulate these companies in order to allow free speech. We don't agree. The problem with regulating these companies is that as soon as you open the door for regulation, you can't control which way you're going to walk through the door. You know, you may walk through one way, but 10 more people are going to walk through the other way. So you open the door, you pass such and such legislation that allows Congress to regulate Twitter. Fantastic. Three years from now, Congress comes forward and uses that regulatory power, or as Dan said before, some executive body agency that you pass that power off to uses that power to start limiting free speech on that platform. The last thing you want to do is open the Pandora's box of regulating these companies. No, what you want to do is if these platforms aren't allowing people to speak, then create new platforms, then find new sources and new areas where people can express themselves freely. If Facebook and Twitter come down and block all of the ideas that you want to hear, then go somewhere else, then go to Parler. If Parler, which is already owned by a big corporation, gets temporarily shut down, then start up your own social networking platform that isn't owned by a big corporation, because if it's owned by a big corporation, it's really not independent. Start your own small independent platform that people can use to actually express those ideas and take away their business because these companies are all driven by the bottom line. If you take millions and millions of their users away, that's going to hurt them. And that will likely change their policies. And if not, who cares? Because now you've got your own platform. Yeah, you have to find a place where you can speak. The public square argument holds no water with me. If you come to my house, there are a number of things which you could say which would get me to throw you out. And that's just the way Starting it is. Starting with saying that you're pro-Apple. Pro-Apple people? No. If you like watermelons, no. Done. You're that's out. why I can't visit Dan. Watermelons are a ridiculous fruit. Just drink a glass of water. There's no seeds in it. He can visit me because I won't throw him out for hating watermelon as much as I might want to. <laughs> there, it's a waste of time. Find a better use of your time than eating watermelon. It takes forever relative to the water you're drinking. <laughs> If I throw you out of my house because I don't like what you said, and you go to the government, you say, First Amendment, you know what they're going to say? It's his property. And that's good. Now, what if everybody's meeting at my house, and we're having a discussion about politics, and it's the happening place? It's the place where things happen. It is the <laughs> the happening place, the place where things happen. <laughs> <laughs> You've already got your slogan for your place. <laughs> and everyone comes over here, everyone of importance. I have the mayor. I have everyone in the city of any importance. If you want to get involved in city politics, you got to get to my house. And I tell you, I don't like you. You can't come over. What, the, what then? Is my house suddenly the public square? Is it suddenly public property? Of course not. You're, you're out of luck. You're out of luck. You're going to have to find some other way to do it. Of course, I'm not inviting a bunch of city officials over to my house. Go visit your local city council. You'll be surprised how much nepotism takes place at the city level. It's... It's kind of, kind of beautiful in its own sick way. You don't get to say that because a lot of people are talking on Facebook, Facebook is the public square. I think that argument is disingenuous. I think it's an excuse. I think, I think what Brad said is exactly right. You have to build something. Now, if your complaint is, look, building something of this size and magnitude is extremely hard. Yes, it is. And there are lots of artificial barriers in the way that shouldn't be there. I agree completely. Let's get rid of the artificial barriers. <laughs> Let's get rid of the, the madness and the red tape. Let's get rid of that. But the fact that it's really hard, I've listened to some Doesn't very mean we should make it harder. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I've listened to some big time Republicans whose arguments for regulating big businesses is basically, I don't want to make another account for a different site. That'd be really annoying. And there's people I really <laughs> like here. I like I like hanging out at your house, Dan. Don't kick me out. I'll tell the government. I'm going to tell the government on you. It's silly. And when you look at the contractual terms of places like Facebook and Twitter, you know what power they have over your account? They have all power. We mentioned this earlier. <laughs> they, if they, can, they can kick you out for any reason. Now, I don't like the way that Twitter threw out Donald Trump. I think what they said about the free speech stuff that we, Brad quoted is garbage. You don't kick him off 
other because some of his followers might interpret it in a way that would lead them to act violently because they're crazy. That's not a good reason to ban him. Now, if you want to ban him, you're a private company. You owe him nothing. Ban him. Ban him. <laughs> but don't give me a load of bullcrap about why, right? If you want yeah. to ban him, that's fine. And you want to tell me why, that's fine. But don't feed me a bunch of bull. That is part of what we're saying here is that, yes, get mad at these companies for the way that it's responding. You know, boycott them. Organize a boycott. Right. We have we have no problem with that. People say you shouldn't have cancel culture. Canceling a business because they're not giving you what you want, that's that's called the market. You know, if Facebook and Twitter aren't providing the needs of the people and you point that out to the people and the people stop using that business, fantastic. Yeah, good. Good. I mean, Twitter's playing a, a, a PR game, right? They have to, as you said, they're in a hard place. They have to, they're going to tick off one group of people no matter what they do. Yeah. And so, and so your solution is not to battle that PR game with the might of government. Your solution is to play the PR game. And, and it'll be a better world for it. We don't want everybody to be using Facebook anyway. That gives way too much, way too much power to a company that, that's giving you, you know, no contractual guarantee at all. You, you might as well have more. And, and I think as technology develops, you'll get ways to integrate them, right? Get ways that you can see your Facebook friends from your whatever account. These are temporary inconveniences and you can deal with them and it's fine. Probably be happier if you deleted your Facebook account and then didn't get another social media account and actually went and <laughs> met your neighbors. Now, now we're cooking with gas, Dan. <laughs> now we're turning people radical. Now we're radicalizing. Oh, no, now, uh, yeah, I mean, I expect to... Uh, the FBI at my door soon. Started a, started a mob. So Brad and I each have, I think, a few things, a few final thoughts, a few take-home notes. I actually well, didn't take I any have, notes. I, but I, I have, have some takeaways. Take I will I will think things after this, but not read any notes. <laughs> Free speech is a complicated issue. We didn't get into libel. We didn't get into uh, fraud. Uh, we touched on hate speech. We touched on inciting violence. Okay. If you want to figure out where to draw those lines, that'd be a really useful way to spend some time on this, on this particular, these poli particular political issues. Where is it just to stop someone from speaking? Now, we're not going to draw that line for you, but I will say if someone starts to actually call for violence, when someone says, let's burn this mother down, as they do in that episode Brad was describing earlier, clearly that person's on one side of the line. The people criticizing it are on a different side of the line. We could at least start there. We could start with, if you're going to accuse someone of inciting violence, they have to actually be calling for violence. You have to find violence recommended in their words, which means something. Yeah, and that may be the biggest takeaway from this episode is that there's a grave difference between being unhappy with someone with what someone is saying and using government force, which is the force of violence, using the threat of violence in order to stop them from saying it. And the only time that's going to be just, as Dan said, is in very particular situations. And the only truly ironclad situation, as Dan said, where someone's speech is worthy of violence is when that speech is directly threatening or calling for violence in a very immediate way, which is a very, very rare thing in terms of speech. And because of that, because of the fact that when you're using violence against someone who's only used words, you need to have every benefit of the doubt on their side. Because if I'm saying things and you're shooting me in the face, what I'm saying has to be very, very bad in order for it to be just. <laughs> it has, right. you know what I mean? And, yeah, yeah, yeah. And yeah. you have to make sure that it passes that threshold, and you have to make sure that that threshold is very, very high. Otherwise, you're going to have a very a serious problem. And we're not there yet. We're not even close to there yet. What we're seeing is a trend in the direction of giving the government more and more of those keys, more and more of the control over what people can say, and that's what we don't want. And what we're worried about is the situation that's occurring here is that we're worried that, strangely enough, that both parties are going to be interested in one way or another in regulating speech. And that's and that's the problem, and that's the danger, and that's what we want to avoid. Yeah, because because yeah. the free exchange of information is is so incredible, especially in today's age, because of technology, 
and losing that would be a true injustice. Yeah, you want people talking about these ideas so they can think about them and work them out and 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 have them corrected to some degree and have you know learn from other people and I can't imagine something that would make that would accelerate us more towards something like a civil war than saying, "All right, we'll have Congress create an executive agency that the president can pick, you know, at least the head of." And we'll have them start deciding what it's okay to say and what's not okay to say. That would be another chip in this poker game that controls our lives that we call politics. I don't want either party to have that chip. I don't no, want that chip in this game. It's a much too powerful chip, yeah. And with that, thank you for listening. This has been episode 28. We encourage you all to share with your friends, radicalize them as fast as possible. You can find us on Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, you can find our podcast on almost all of the major podcast apps and locations, including Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, Spotify, etc. Our website is rethinkingpolitics.podbean.com. Email us at rethinkingpoliticspodcast at gmail. And you can support us on Patreon. The link is on our website. Thank you for listening and have a wonderful day. 